Hello everyone, my name is Marcel Ribeiro Dantas. I'm a developer advocate at Sequera for Latin America and the Caribbean for the Nextflow and NFCore communities. Welcome to the hands-on training. This is the second training we are, we are providing this month of September 2023. Uh, you probably saw the foundational training that we had at the beginning of the month. In case you are new to Nextflow and you haven't watched it, I really recommend you to go to the NFCore YouTube channel and check this three day, uh, three days train that we provided. So the foundational training is, is focused on, on helping people on their first experience on Nextflow. It's very basic. We, we have a very slow pace. We get in a lot of details about concepts and channel operators, channel factories, and Nextflow processes, Nextflow workflows and all these things. So it's a very important first step for you. And if you haven't watched it yet, I recommend you to do it. If you did, or if you already did in the past something like this, you already feel like you're your intermediate level in Nextflow, this hands-on training is perfect for you. It's much shorter than the other trainings we have done, and it's very hands-on oriented. So we have this pipeline that we're gonna play with, a bit, with it a bit, and you, you try to fill some gaps that I've, I've left so that you can try to remember more about what you knew about Nextflow, or just get more experience on, on how to do that. So the first thing I want to show you is the page, the hands-on training. So it's gonna be a single day, just today, about two hours, maybe a bit less. If you have any question during or after the training, you can go to this channel, September 23, hands-on training on the Slack channel, on the NFCore in Nextflow Slack. It's a shared channel between the two Slack workspaces. So there will be people to answer your questions during this training, but also afterwards. So it's a perfect place to ask. There are many different channels in this Slack workspaces both the Nextflow and the NFCore 1, places, channels very specific to a few, to do some type of, of questions and things like this. But don't worry, for this first day, for your first experience in touch with Nextflow, and ask any of your questions in this channel. So regardless of maybe your question may be more fair to a different channel, don't worry. This is a channel for you to answer all your questions, okay? So it's important to mention that just like we had before, uh, the foundational training, we're gonna also have the advanced training in a few days. So after doing the foundational training and now the hands-on training, if you feel confident enough, go ahead and take this advanced training. The hands-on training that we are doing now, it's the first time we are, we are, we are doing that uh, in the current version of this. So maybe we're gonna run into some issues, I don't know, some bugs, but we, let's hope not, right? And the advanced training is the same thing, it's the first time it's being, uh, it's been shared in this current format. So both are new trainings and you'll be like the first cohort taking them. The next step is to go to the train, the official community training portal, right? It's training.nextflow.io. When you join this website, that's what you're going to see. And you, if you've done the foundational training, you're going to remember that this is the link to go there. But now you're going to, do, to go to the second one here. So launch the hands-on training, right? So uh, a few warnings, like the first warning is that this hands-on training is a next flow course, right? It's a next flow training. We are not interested in teaching you bioinformatics now, the best way of doing variant calling or any type of bioinformatic analysis. We are not trying to teach you basic concepts of next flow. This is a different course, okay? If you are still not sure about some next flow concepts like channel factories, channel operators, Nextflow processes and all these things, Nextflow modules. Maybe you should go back to the foundational training, like click here on basic training and check the sections that you don't feel confident enough, right? So here's gonna be a, a bit in a faster pace. I will still try to explain it as much as I can, but I won't be able to get in the, in the required detail if it's your first time working with Nextflow, fine? So if you're looking for a real variant calling Nextflow pipeline, there are plenty out there. One example here, a few examples here are the NF Course Direct Pipeline, the Viral Recon, and the RNAVR. So these three are production ready, very amazing, up to date, you know, best you can get for variant calling. So you're going to find the best practices there, the best tools, the best versions, the best way, everything. Data to test, you know, these things. Here we're going to play with the, with the variant calling pipeline, far from ideal, okay? So some versions of the software is gonna be outdated. The practice we are using, maybe it's not the best practice currently. So be aware of that. 
the goal here is not to write this amazing Nexo pipe pipeline from a scientific point of view. So we have this pipeline here for you to, to inspire yourself to learn more about the volume calling. And I mean, after I've said this a few times, that's the goal here, right? So we're gonna not really implement because it's almost already uh, implemented, but we are kind of implement a variant calling pipeline for RNA-seq data on Nextflow. The first section that I would like to, to get into details with you is the data description section. So here I'm going to talk about every input data of this pipeline. Then I'm going to talk about the steps how to set up your environment, and then we're gonna go to the pipeline implementation. Why I'm doing that? There are a lot of input files and a lot of steps with a lot of different tools. If I try at the same time to explain everything, it can get very conf very confusing. So the first time here, I'm gonna talk about the data, the steps, the setup, of the, the setup of the environment, and when all these skills are clear to you, we're going to, we're going to go to the next flow code. So the first input file here is the genome assembly, right? So this is the reference genome uh, for Homo sapiens, right? So it was uh, obtained from gene bank, but it's specific to the chromosome 22. So you have the whole genome, of course. Here, it's not the full reference. It's a small piece of the genome. And you may ask, why would I be interested only in the chromosome 22? There could be a few reasons, but here the reason is just because we want something small that you can play and see the results quickly. A real variant calling pipeline with a lot of samples and all these things could take hours, a lot of time, even more than that. It's not go here. We want something that you can, in a few minutes, run the full pipeline, right? So we're going to have a few samples, and everything is going to be a piece of a real sample. So starting with the reference genome here is only the chromosome 22. The RNA seq reads, same thing, they come from a human cell line, but even though the RNA seq is full, we only have here reads that were mapped to a specific locus in the chromosome 22. So again, very small region of the genome because we want it to be quick. Here you have a table with some information about this, this, this samples, right? I won't get into detail here. Uh, they are parent uh, rna data. The, the, the third input is going to be known variants. So it's a VCF file already compressed. So these known variants, they come from high confident variant calls for this specific cell line, okay? For this Illumina Platinum Genomes project. The idea is that we use many different tools to do this variant calling, to, to use pedigree information. We did the best to have this uh, gold standard set of known variants. Sometimes you want to find something novel, right? And then by comparing to a set of known variants, we know what, would we, what, what we are expected to find and what's new, right? So this is the, the, the goal of having the known variants here, variants that are expected to be found. The other input file are the blacklisted regions. So these are regions in the genome with anomalous coverage. We know that it's usually difficult to map to these regions, or maybe they, they map in a very weird way. They have a high ratio of multi-mapping to unique mapping reads. It's a high variance uh, area in terms of uh, mappability. So the name is clear, it's a blacklisted region. So you usually want to be careful with these regions. So as you can see here, we have only four inputs, the reference genome, the reads, the known variants and blacklisted regions. Of course, we're gonna have a lot of intermediate versions of these uh, files and outputs of other programs. So this can get very complex in the end. Uh, actually, I have open here, uh, let me see if I can find, yeah, here. So here is a is a is a DAG, it's a, DAG, 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 uh, a directed acyclic graph, right? That shows you this pipeline that we're gonna build in the end. Here you have the input in this box, and every node is a step in the pipeline. And these directed are, uh, edges they show you what's going to be, what's what's happening, right? So the the prepared genome PCAR, for example, has one input which is a reference genome. The same thing for the prepared, prepared genome some tools. Uh, this prepared VCF file, it gets the variance file, the blacklisted regions, is going to provide the input for two other processes, which is the RNA-seq JTK recalibrate, and also the post-process VCF. So as you can see, it's a bit complicated, but not even close to a real pipeline. So real pipelines are much more complex than that, right? Okay, so let's go back to 
Uh, it's worth training with you, right? Okay, so these are the four inputs, even though there are a lot of new intermediate files that we're going to find at some point. The next section is the workflow description. This one, it can get confusing. And as I said, the goal is not to teach bioinformatics, so I cannot get an extremely detail here, but I will try to do my best. And again, this, this material is available, it's training.netcrow.io. You can read it with more calm afterwards, read more than one time, it's up to you. And of course, you can go to the channels like and ask all your questions, even if they are bioinformatics related. Here, I won't get into much detail just because it's a matter of making sure we're going to be able to cover the whole material in the time that we have. So for the workflow description, in this section, we're going to see what we're going to do in every step as if we didn't have next row, right? Just see what tools are going to be used, the parameters, the options, and all these things, so that when we get to the pipeline implementation, it's somewhat clear in your mind what are the input files, what are the steps of our pipeline. So, as I said, the goal of this pipeline is variant calling, right? We're going to process some raw RNA-seq data. They are in FASTQ format, which is the format they are expected to have. Uh, and we're going to obtain, yeah, the list of small variants. Single nucleotide polymorphisms in DAOs. So, small changes in, this, in, in the reads. Uh, compared to some reference or some insertions and deletions of some bases, right? Uh, the pipeline is somewhat based on the JTK best practice for variant calling, but again, the goal here was not to be up to date and use the best practice and everything else. It's to learn next flow, as in the <clears throat> as in having some hands-on experience on the real pipeline, like we had with the RNA seq pipeline in the foundational training. So the steps are going to be processed. Uh, independently of it for each replicate, just the way we usually do in XFlow. Uh, we're going to map the reads, we're going to split at the cigar. So the cigar is, is the way to specify the, the quality of some part of the mappings, right? Uh, at some point, you can have an N, which represents some, time, some type of, of uh, splice, injunction, injunction in these things. So we're going to split some point. Lots of things going to happen. And the variant calling will be done. We're going to do some recalibration. So let's go is lower in every part. So the first part is, for the software manuals, every program that we're going to use is in this list here. So we're going to use some tools, we're going to use PCAR, we're going to use STAR, we're going to use VCF tools, and we're going to use a lot of commands from the GATK tools, right? So you can click here and see all the manuals and information about all these commands and all these programs. If you are, if you are feeling a bit lost about what these programs do, I recommend you pause the video now and go to the website and have a read in each of these commands or programs, just to make sure you have a somewhat understanding of what, what, what they do. Each of them do multiple things actually, so take your time. Now let's go to the pipeline steps. The first step is to prepare the data, right? So you, we have the reference genome, uh, which is a FASTA file, the genome.fa here. We're going to use some tools to create an index for that, for a, a genome index. We're going to use PCAR to also do that. And you may ask, why would I do that, right? Uh, you're going to use star at some point to do the same. As I said, even though we have four input files, we're going to have a lot of intermediate files that are outputs of some steps, of some processes, and they're inputs to the next. So these three indexes that we are building with star, with PCAR, and with some tools, they are required for next steps in the pipeline. So in the, it maybe doesn't make a lot of sense to start from, from the bottom, but that's how usually we do. We prepare what we need in the next step. Then what we need in the next one, we prepare in this one. And so we go, right? Then we're going to use uh, the VCF tools to handle this known variance file that we have and the blacklisted one. Uh, and the idea is to filter out the blacklisted regions from the, from the known variants to reduce false positives, right? This is optional, but we are doing it here. The second step after preparing these input files, right, we're going to map the RNA-seq reads, the reads from, the, from our samples, from the human cell line, to the reference genome, right? We're going to use a two-pass approach. The, the idea of the first one is to create a table with the splice junctions, and at some point, we're going to do the, the realignment. 
So first pass, this is the command. I won't get into detail about all the parameters. That's not the goal here. We're gonna use this command with all these parameters. Here we have the name of the samples, right? Uh, the first and the, and the second uh, parent read of the sample. We're gonna create a new genome index using splice junction table, what we created in the previous step. And then we're gonna define our alignment here, right? This will give us a BAM file, which is an, an alignment file. Get the reads in terms of the re reference genome, how well, where they mapped, okay? We're gonna use some tools to create an index out of this uh, alignment file. And I've said indexes a few times already, and maybe you're you are asking what's an index, right? So these files, they're massive files, and they're not always so easy to, to handle. So you have this huge file, you want to do some, some search of some string or something like this, and sometimes they can, this can be very computationally intensive. By creating these indexes, you make it easier for other tools to access information about that file. So these are indexes that are created for. The next step that is to split these reads whenever you have this n cigar, right? That's what the, uh, we're gonna use a JTK command to do that, which is split n cigar reads. And the idea is to create more reads because you are splitting reads whenever you have this n, right? After doing this split, again, we have lots of parameters here. The type, here's the command of the JTK that we're going to use, the reference genome, uh, the final alignment data, you know, uh, the name of the output. We're gonna fix a few things here. We're gonna allow n cigar reads. The goal is not to explain these options here. There are plenty of options, lots lot of different programs, right? This is what's going to be done. As I said a while ago, this is as if we were not using Nextflow. So everything's hard-coded here, as you can see. I'm using the name of the files here. Everything's hard-coded. It would break if I change a single letter in the name of the files and everything else. With Nextflow, a lot of these things will be handled by Nextflow. But before we get there, we need to understand every step of this relatively simple pipeline, okay? The next step is to do a base recalibration. So the thing is, this workflow does not include an in-depth realignment step. Right, so we exclude that since it's very time intensive, and the goal here is not to waste like the whole day waiting for something to finish. Just like we use only the chromosome 22 and everything related to that the same way, we exclude this step because it's quite time intensive. Instead of that, we're gonna do a base recalibration step. We're gonna use the JTK uh, tool again with these two commands, and you have here lots of the parameters, the known variance filtered, right, and everything else. When we get at this point, we can finally do the variant calling. So the variant calling is gonna be done with this command here, with the ATK, the haplotype caller, but before, we're gonna create an index and do some filtering, right? All these parameters, again, basically they are following some best practice, so keep clusters of at least three SNPs that are within a window of 35 bases between them, and you have these options here, right? So we could take hours and hours getting into detail of every command and option, but it's not a bioinformatics course. Okay. At some point, we're gonna use grab and awk in Perl, with are some uh, interpreters and command line options in, in Linux mostly, so that you can use to filter these files and get what's interesting to you. So basically here we are considering only sites that pass all filters and are covered with at least eight reads. So in the end, that's right, what this weird command does. After that, in this post-processing, we're gonna basically have NUM, single nucleotide variations, which will be used for the analysis of a little specific expression. And we're going to have novel variants, which will be used to detect RNA editing agents. Then we compare these two variant files to detect common and different sites, BCF tools. We're gonna use a, w, uh, a WK again, VSF choose, and at some point we're gonna use uh, R script to do a plot, right? We're gonna calculate reads uh, with GATK command. So this is somewhat in a quick way because the goal is not really this one here. What is going to be done in this pipeline? So prepare data, map the RNA seq data to the reference genome, split. Uh, the reads, do a base recalibration, perform the variant, variant calling, which is the, the main thing we want to do here, do some variant filtering, and then do some variant post-processing. Sounds simple when we look here and very complex when we see here, but mostly because all these commands, they have plenty of options, 
plenty of parameters and maybe you're feeling like we should get in detail here, but I'm going to show you one thing. If you go to the NF Core website and you check the modules, for example, a module is a, is a component, is like a wrapper for a tool in the next row pipeline. We have over a thousand modules, right? So maybe if you get, you know, JTK, let's see this one here. And we see, let's open the GitHub repository for that. We open the main. And you're gonna see here, lots of different options. You see, it's not hard coded. So we have variables here to be replaced by some configuration, some settings, some process directive, some uh, input variables, right? But you're not really going to, to like fight with that or use your time to, to set these things. You're going to import this module into your pipeline. You're going to provide the inputs, the settings that matter to you, and the rest is already done. So even in practice, when you're building your pipeline, if you have an NF Core module, you won't really be fighting with all these options and, and, and everything like that. So have you understood this part? Let's go now to the environment setup. And here what I want to show you is that we're gonna use Gitpod to have this hands-on experience in this, in this training, right? So Gitpod is this platform, this service that provides to you virtual environments in your browser. So if you use VS Code to, to program to write code, it provides a version of, of VS Code that, that exists in your browser. And the way it's handled with a virtual machine on their side is that if there's a power outage in your, in your house and your computer turns off and stuff, when it turns on and you go back to your Gitpod environment, everything will be there the way you left, even like selection of text and everything like this. So it's not on your computer, it lives in the cloud. And this is very useful because instead of having to install uh, Docker or do some configuration, maybe you use Windows, maybe you use Mac OS, maybe you use Linux, maybe you use a different version of anything, or you cannot, you don't have permissions to install software. So these things can be a hindrance if you're trying to, to learn, right? So the idea is that you're gonna use a Gitpod environment so that you can have an environment that we already built for you with everything that you will need already installed, including the files that we will be needing for this analysis, like the input files. When you click here to open on Gitpod, what's going to happen is that you have to create an account, right? Uh, there's a free account and it's fine. You are fine to use it. I would probably recommend you to use a large machine up, up to eight core, 16 gigabytes of RAM and stuff. This, it, you won't have as many free hours as you would have with the standard, but the large one is gonna help you make things run quicker and then you're gonna use your time more to learn than to wait the pipeline to finish, right, the steps. After you create an account, you can choose this one and click continue. This is going to open a, a VS Code on your browser, as I said. It's gonna open the, the, the training. I already have here an instance open with some cache that we don't waste too much time. And what's going to happen is that you're gonna see the, uh, a simple browser here with the training material, the one I was showing you before, like you can see here. And then you have lots of files here and everything else. So the first thing you have to do, let's go here, launch on, head on training, environment setup. There's a bite-sized talk on, on the NF Core YouTube channel where I explain lots of things related to Gitpod and I won't get into much detail here, but basically know that you're gonna have a terminal on the bottom here. On the left, you have a file explorer, and you can open this file in the terminal, type in code, and the name of the file, and it's gonna be open here as a tab, so you can have a look at it. So let me move this here. Okay, so the first thing you're gonna do, it's going to, when you open this, you're gonna be in the NF training folder. This is not what you want, this is for the foundational training, as it's saying here, the first thing you're going to do is to type this command. So whenever you have these boxes on the training material, you can click on this icon here to copy the content. Then you go here, right button, paste, and you're gonna be in the right folder, right? So you can type tree and, and dot here, and you're gonna see all the files. Here I played already a bit with this uh, Gitpod environment, so there's a lot of extra files, but that's what you're going to see at the beginning. 
So there's a readme file, there's a bin folder, which has a script file inside. There's a data folder, which has the four input, the three input files we mentioned and the folder with the reads, which are all these other input files that we saw, right? In the end, we have a final underlying main.nf pipeline, which is the pipeline that in the end we're going to build. I was playing with it here. In the end, it took tw about 20 minutes to run. Let me see if I can find it here in the output. And uh, not this one. Mm. Okay, this pipeline in the end, it takes about 20 minutes. So I lost it here, but I can run again with next flow run resume. I already ran this, this pipeline, so all the steps are going to be cached. Because I use dash resume, I'm gonna ask Nextflow to only rerun the steps that I never did and cache everything else. So as you can see, there are many steps here. Uh, this six of six, because we have six samples, right? Uh, and everything's cached, so there's no worry here. Okay, so we're gonna use Docker, of course. It's, it's very important to use Docker for reproducibility reasons. Uh, and in this training, we're going to use the best practice when it comes to container technologies and Nextflow, which is to use a single container image to every process. So basically what this means is that I'm gonna have in the first step, one container image, in the second step, a second container image, and unless another step has the same uh, requirements of tools of a previous one, I won't reuse uh, containers. Here, we're gonna just choose one of these containers, which is a container that, co that has some tools, and we're gonna use Docker to pull this container and enter this container and play a bit with it. So let's command V here, let's space, I'm gonna bring the terminal a bit to the top. Uh, it says, I already have this image in this container, because indeed I was playing with that before. And if you have never used it or pulled it, you would see, you would see like download complete and so on. I'm gonna use this other command now, which is a Docker command. I'm gonna run this container image, I wanna see a container. I want it to be removed after it stopped, and I want to get a terminal to play with that. And the entry point is gonna be bash. Bash is a, is a shell, right, that you can type commands. So I want this container to be run with bash, and I want to be able to interact with that. So I press enter. At some point, I'll be given a shell. I'm not git pod anymore. I'm root because inside this container I'm root and I'm going to do some tools dash dash version and I have some tools one, three, one. If I do this outside the container, click exit it to, to leave, some tools are not installed. So you see you have this isolated environment with the tool that you need to use. One thing is important to do is to give execution permission to this ggist file, this script file. Okay, with that, we have our setup, our environment set up. We have this Git pod environment with everything we need installed. We have Docker, uh, we have Docker, we have Nextflow, we are using the Edge version, I think, 23rd, yeah. So, okay, and now let's go to the next part, which is the pipeline implementation, right? I'm going to hide the file explorer so we have more, oops, more screen. Okay, and here we start the, the real part of this of this training. Now that it's somewhat clear for you about the data that we're going to use, the software we're going to use, what we are trying to do and achieve, let's go to the next full part, which is the real goal here. So we separated in, in all the steps, like we have one, two, three, four, and so on, but like the prepare, like the inputs, we have one A, B, C, and D, then start mapping, the split, the recalibrate, the variant calling, the post-processing, and then some overview about the results. Okay, let's try to, to take the best out of this pipeline example here. So regarding data preparation, we saw that we have this data folder here with all the reads, with the blacklisted.bad, the genome.far, in the known variants, the VCF file, which is compressed. Okay, we already know that this genome, this reference genome, it's only for the chromosome 22. Uh, 
uh, we have this reads here. I say it's 76 base pairs paired and pair read ends paired and reads. Sorry. We have the variance file, which is the known variance, and then we have the blacklist files. Everything we saw already. The first thing we're going to do is to now that we are in this folder slash workspace slash git pause slash hands on, we're going to type code main.nf and we're going to paste this code there. So we can click on this icon here, come here, command T, command S to save. And we're going to type next flow, oops, next flow run main.nf. Nothing is going to be printed because apart from the basics, they, they always think because we didn't print anything here. We just set some variables. We are saying that the genome is this one, the variance is this one, and so on. And as we know, because we have the params dot here, it means that we can change the override this variable definition by just saying genome something else, right? And then it won't be this base dear data genome anymore. So it's saved. One thing we'll start doing now is every time we run a pipeline, this main.nf, I want you to also add the dash resume. This is gonna save us from having to recompute everything every time we do a change, right? A new thing that you didn't see here because we saw this for inputs is the results parameter. So at some point in the end, we want to store our results to a folder. And I'm saying here, this folder is going to be called results. So here there are some instructions about copying and pasting and so on. You run this and let's go to the first problem that we have to solve. So the way I'm going to do that is that I'm going to show you the problem, give you some hint regarding the solution. And I'm going to ask you to pause the video and try to solve this on your Git pod instance. After you spend, I don't know, five minutes, if you haven't made it work, then I would ask you to come back here, unpause the video and see the solution. And then later you can go back and try to do it again alone. Because depending on your knowledge of Nextflow, maybe you're going to be stuck and it won't be very productive to just spending hours trying to solve that. So my recommendation is that if in five minutes you can't solve that, stop, come back to the video and keep watching. And later, with more calm, you can come back and try to do it again. So our first problem is that we have all these param parameter definitions here but we don't have input. So the first thing is create a channel to get the reads, the information about the reads, right? And it has a tip here saying, use the from file pair channel factory. As we saw in the foundational training, the, channels factor, the channel, channel factories are Nextflow special processes to create Nextflow channels out of regular variables. So you may have a string that points to a path where your files is and you use where your files are and you use from file pairs to read the files in this folder that we are saying they are pairs and collect them them as pair of files right again don't forget the dash resume so pause the video now because i'm about to show the solution so the solution that here you saw the blank that's what we're going to have every time so wherever you have blank you have to replace with the solution. So here it already shows it's a single line. And the solution here is to use the channel dot from file pairs and pass the param dot reads that we saw here is a path to this folder saying every file that starts with this underline one or two. And because there's only two files that have this beginning, we're gonna have one parent read, right? Two files, right? For the first time we build this pipeline, we're going to do that because by doing that, we're going to have a very quick response. And at the end, we can run with all the samples. It's going to take a bit longer, but then it will be more real, let's say. So now you can copy this, go to your main.nf and edit at the bottom. If you run this again, you won't see anything because you're not, there's no process, there's no printing, but it will create this channel. Believe me for now. Then let's go to the next step, which is to create a faster genome index. We have the faster genome reference. I want to create an index using some tools. So again, it tells you the name of the process. What it does, which is a script block, is to create a genome index for the genome with some tools. 
the input is the genome FASTA file, the reference genome, and the output is the index that sum is going to create. So I even give you here the whole process. We're going to use this container, which is in BioContainer. So BioContainer is a project that they create, where they create a Docker container for every recipe they have in Bioconda. So if you have a, a, a software on Bioconda, you have a Biocontainer with the software. Sometimes you're going to need containers with more than one tool, and then you can create a mod container. If you go to the foundational training on the container uh, section, I teach you how to create a mullet container there or how to request one. We're going to have the input a path, which gonna, we're going to call genome, and the output is going to be the name of this genome.fai. And what this step does is to run the sum tools command uh, software with the fai.dx command and the name of the genome, which is a path here. The workflow is what we did before, but now it's blank. So what do I, what's missing here? A call to this process. So what you need to do in this task is to write a line here that will call this process with the input it requires. So I'm going to show you a solution. So if you want to try it, pause the video and three, two, one. So the solution is everything we saw already with the previous line in the workflow block that we already had with a new one which is prepare, underline genome, underline some tools, and then you can even click this plus here. Every time you see a line in the, in the, in the code block with a plus, you can click there and you're going to have some description about this very specific line. So here we have to provide the params.genome as input to this uh, process. You may ask, why don't I put here the path of the, the reference genome? I know it's here. It's in data slash genome.fa. And indeed, it's here. But maybe someday you would like to do genome data another reference genome.fa. And by doing that, it won't break your pipeline because every time uh, you're using the reference genome, you're actually uh, using this params.genome. And this is overwritten. This is overwritten when you provide the dash dash genome here or dash dash variants or dash dash blacklist. So this is the right way to, to create an actual pipeline that makes it very resistant to changes, right? It won't break easily. Uh, one interesting thing here that I mentioned in the foundational training is like you are calling a process, but you're not providing a channel. You're providing a string, a value. And we know that processes, they only receive channels. The interesting thing here is that when you pass a regular variable that has a single value, which is the case here, one string, next row we will implicitly create a, a value channel and put as the single value there the string or the value that you're providing. So actually when we pass a params.something to a process, this process is receiving a value channel. And if you don't remember the difference between a value channel and a queue channel, I recommend you to go back to the foundational training, but in, in short words, a channel, a queue channel is consumed, every element is consumed and it's gone. You cannot consume the same element for the same process twice. But for a value channel, you can the same process can consume it infinite times, as long as other inputs require another pair, right? The next step is to create a sequence dictionary with Picard. Again, we have some definitions here. The name of the process is going to be prepare underline genome underline picard the command will create a genome dictionary for the genome fasta the reference genome that we have with the picard tools the input again is going to be the reference genome dot fa and the, the, the fasta file and the output is going to be a genome dictionary file created by picard so this is the third problem we are solving here again we're going to have this blank somewhere and we have to replace this blank with a solution here we have, again, the definition. We are using a different container image because now it has Picard, right? The input, we're going to call it genome, just like before. The output now, we have a different format here. We want it to be .dict, and we're going to get the base name of this genome file. It's going to be a path. I want the base name as the name of this output file. I'm going to use the Picard Grid Sequence Dictionary, this file, the output I say here, which is what it is. And if you are a bit 
new to Nextflow and it's not clear to you what are these outputs. So in a script block in your pipeline, it can create many different files. It can create log files. Depending on the program that you're using, it can create hundreds of files. And at the end, you don't really care. You just want the output of the program, the result of your analysis. So when you say output is this, it could be many things also, but here's one thing. When you say this, you mean, you know, probably lots of things were created in this dictionary, but the only output that I want to put in the output channel for next processes is this one. And what we're saying here is that only the .dict file that is created with this command is going to be added to the output channel, which is going to be the input channel of the next process. So we have here everything we've been seeing so far, but now there's a blank. So here is explaining what the dot base name does. It returns the file name without the file suffix. So if it's like human.fa, it's going to be just human. So no path, no for, no no file format, just the base name. And then you can add whatever you want, which in here is the dot dict. So I'm going to show the solution. Again, what we have to do here is just like before, we have to call this prepare genome picard but we have to pass something. And this answer is kind of, kind of obvious because we are creating index, index again with the reference genome again. And I will ask you to pause if you want to try, but I'm going to open the solution in three, two, one. Very simple, right? We're going to create an index from a reference file. Same thing. Just pass the, refer the genome reference file for this process. And you know, while we are doing that every time, you could simply come here and keep adding these things. So I didn't add the process A, but I could come here and get process A, press one, one A. And if I try to run this, with the dash resume always, so that we, we use the cache, And it worked. So prepare the genome with some tools here with Picard. That's what we see here. It's one of one because we have a single ref genome reference file. So it's one task. We have here the hash of the task. So we could do three work with the def which is the default work directory. AD C94 tab. And we have here uh, the index file that was created, the, the file, right? We have the input, and that's the, the output. Same thing I could do for the other, so tree, work, fb, 62, and we have the genome.dict. And this way we keep going, right? Let's go now to the 1c, and we're gonna create now our third index. Again, this time we're gonna use the star, mapping software, the name of the process is going to be prepare star genome index. What the command does is to create a genome index with star for this genome reference file. The input as always is going to be the genome FASTA file and the output will be a directory containing the star genome index. So that's the way star works. It creates a folder with a lot of different files. A container process directive again. And if it's not clear for you what this does, when you use a process directive, which is these directives that happen that, that take place at the beginning of a process block. It's telling if I'm using Docker, this is the container image you have to use for this task. And if you are asking if we are using Docker, we can see the nextflow.config file here, and it has docker.enable equal true, which means by default, we want to always use Docker here for all uh, these processes, whenever there's a container directive, right? The one see here, again, is very simple, very similar as before. We have an input. The output is the folder now, so no file extension. We just say genome under R&D. We create the folder and we run star and we say where is going to be the, the output here, right? And in the workflow, we have to add a new line. Can you guess what the new line is going to be? Prepare underline star, underline genome, underline index, which is the name of this process like before. And what are we going to pass as input? It's the same thing as before. this now so let's copy this so what we can do is to copy everything and just keep removing the workflow block so we're gonna always add 
the next process and the workflow block is going to be uh, up to date. We can run this with next will run. And in the meantime, while, while it's running, we can go to the next one to start understanding what's going on. So now we want to filter uh, to filter the variant file, right? So we have the known variants, which again is variants in the, in the human genome that have been obtained in this case with multiple different software so that we have a high confidence of what we obtained using pedigree information and all these things. And now that we have that, we want to filter the blacklist with the blacklist file these regions that have that usually have are, are prone to artifacts right you want to decrease the the false positive rate in your in your final analysis so we're going to have now two input files this is the first process in this uh training where we have more than in one input file can you remember how it's written when we have this on next row? that's how you do it we're going to have just in a different line so i'm going to have one input that I'm calling variance file, whatever it is, when it's inside the process, I'm, I will be able to refer to it with the variance file handle, the variable. And the other one, which is the blacklisted. Here, I have a mullet container because I'm going to need VCF tools and Tabix. So I need a container with these two softwares. So I had to request this mullet container to be created in the BioContainers project. So we're going to, in the end, create a file containing the filtered and recorded set of variants. This is the command, the commands we're going to use. And the output is going to be a, a channel element, which is one, but it has two items. The tuple where the first one uh, is the, the, the filtered uh, variant, the VCF file, but the second one is the TBI. And then again, we have now to, fi to, to, to resolve this gap here, this blank line. It's obvious that we have to call this prepare underline VCF underline file process, but what do we provide as input? We know it's variance file and blacklisted, but what would we do? What would we provide? Maybe these two guys? I don't know. I'm gonna start, I mean, if you want to try, pause this video because I'm gonna show the solution in three, two, and one. And that's exactly what we have to do to provide the variance and the blacklist. In Nextflow, at least for now, we don't have named arguments, which means that whatever you put as the first argument here is going to be the first one here, and whatever second is going to be the second one here. So whenever you are unsure about which argument, which channel, which value should be first or second, you look at the process block and you see what's the first and what's the second. And that's the positional arguments. That's the way by default that Nextflow works. So take as input this guy here. As you see here in the in the script block, we have this placeholders, right? Replace this with the base name of variants file. Exclude the bad, and we do the blacklist file and so on. In the end, use Tabix. And let's copy this, replacing our workflow block here in the bottom. Why I'm doing that? Because the workflow block is always redone for us with the new line in the solution and the new process is added. So let's run this again now with resume. And we're going to have now fourth step here. Good. I'm going to clean the terminal a bit. This ends the first part. Process 1A, B, C, and D. We just did them. We're gonna now that we prepare these input files, we're gonna start mapping the reads of the samples to the reference genome using the indexes that we created, right? So let's go to process two. We're gonna create a new process which is called RNA seq mapping star. The input now it's three inputs. We have the genome FASTA file, which is the genome reference file, the .fa. We're going to have the star genome index, which is the index we created with star. And we are going to have a tuple containing the ID in the, in, as a first item. And the second item is a list of the reads. So as you see here, we have this guy, for example, 
the C, O, Q, 1, and we have the read 1 and read 2. So this first part before the underline is the ID, you can see it this way, and these two files are the reads. When you do the channel from file pairs and you provide a path the way we did here at the very beginning, actually at the beginning of the workflow block, what this is going to do, I can do a view here so you see the contents. Let's do this. The view is a channel operator in Nextflow to consume every element of a channel and print it to the screen. So we have here the ID as the first, This everything here is a channel element, a single channel element. The first item is the ID and the second item is a list, see the brackets, here's a list with all the elements, the, the other items, which here is the read one and read two, it's the path to each of them. So in this mapping here, we have to map every read to the reference genome using the index. And in the end, we're going to have something similar to that, a replicate ID, but here we're going to have the aligned band file and the aligned band index file. So this is the file showing how this every read, each read mapped to the reference genome. So we have the whole process here. It's, it's mulled again because we use star and we're going to use also some tools. So we need two softwares in one container image. So we had to create a mulled container. Three inputs, the genome, which is the path. So here the names kind of help you find the answer, but remember, you can put any name here. Whatever is the first one, when you want to refer to that within the process, you're going to use the name you chose to be here. We chose genome for the first one, genome deer for the second one, and a tuple for the third one. The first part, I want to refer to it as replicate ID, and the second one, reads. As we know that the second part is a list with elements, reads is going to be this list with all these elements, these items, which are the reads. For the output, we already saw, we wanted to have the replicate ID, the band file, and the band bay file, the index of the aligned files, right? We have here the star command with all these options. Uh, using reads here is going to have the two, to show the two reads, the read one and read two for the alignment. Uh, we have here, we are, we are passing the test.cpu. This is a process directive in Nextflow. By default, it's one. But if we had here something like CPUs four, it would try to use four CPUs, right? And we have other options here. Again, if you have questions about that, you can go to the beginning of the section of the pipeline implementation and you can check the manual of every tool. This is the first path that we saw. Then we have the second pass, the final read alignments that we saw in the workflow description. And in the end, we're going to create the index of the band file to help us to work in the next steps with these aligned reads. And now we have the blank here. Again, the blank is going to be a call to this process, but we have to, to provide these three inputs. If you want to try that, pause the video. Again, I think five minutes is, is enough to try to solve these questions. If, it takes, if it's taking longer than five minutes, I would recommend you to stop, come back and watch the training and try the next ones. And later you can come back and try again or redo it or something like this. And every question you have, either during the, the, the training or afterward, you can go to the, to the Slack workspaces and ask in the September 23 uh, hands-on training, okay? So I'm gonna open the solution in three, two, one. And the solution is basically to call the params.genome that we used before here, the reference genome. And then the output of the prepared star genome index. So this guy here, this prepare uh, star genome index, is the one that's going to create the index with star for the reference genome. And because we are using star here to line, we also need this index. By using dot out, you are getting the output channel from this process. So when this is over, when it puts the result in the channel, I want this channel to be the input of the next one, which is this one here, right? And then we are going to pass the reads that we just saw here. 
the channel created with the from file pairs channel factory so let's copy all of this replace our workflow block again and as you can see the pipeline is getting already kind of long right the one the, the one a one b one c one d then we're going to go now to the alignment and everything is here so let's run this again with resume the first four steps they're cached already so only the fifth will be computed that's what we are, we are seeing here we only have two reads of the same sample so it's going to be one of one right we're going to align each read to this uh, reference genome to the using the index that we created before while it's running let's go to the next step the next step is a filtering step using gtk so for each sample we're going to have this reads with the cigar information on on the quality and how the map occurred we're going to look for the n and then we're going to split this n at this end these reads which are gonna create more reads for us so here it's, it shows you that this n corresponds to the segments of the original read beside between the splicing events so they're represented by this n so here we have four input files so the process is going to be named rnacx the line gatk and the line split and cigar what we're going to do is to split these reads on these ends using gatk and the input is going to be the genome faster file again the index made with some tools the genome dictionary made with picard in a tuple containing the id the align band and the index from this align band which is the output of the previous step and the output is going to be a tuple containing the replicate id the split bun file and the split bun index file so this is the process block using the split and cigar reads the command from UATK. here we have the indexes here, the inputs sorry here we have the outputs we have this container image from broad institute with GATK and we have here a new thing which is a process directive called tag this tag is very interesting because when you have multiple uh, samples and you have one of ten two of ten sometimes you want to know which sample is being processed at this specific moment and when it fails you want to know which one failed or which one did it which one didn't fail so by using this tag and providing here the replicate ad id which is here we're gonna make it appear in here beside the the, the name of the process which sample is being processed for that task at that single moment so it's just something we add, we add here. It doesn't really change anything in the analysis, but it's better for you to debug and monitor your pipeline execution. So again, we have here the blank. So I'm going to give you a few minutes to try to do that. And pause if you want to try. I'm going to open the solution in one, two, three, go. And that's what we have. You see we have the output of the process that create that created an index with some tools we have the output of the process that created a, a sequence dictionary with picard and we have the output of the process that created an index not not, not an index but the, here's the, the the line files with uh star let's copy this and override our workflow block and we can run again so this tag it's also useful in the previous uh, step whenever you have multiple samples being done in a process it's useful to use this tag so that you can see what sample is being processed at the time right and maybe while it's running it would be interesting to 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 remind you that a process is a definition so what we write here is a process right this is a process but every time you instantiate this process you have a task so if i have three samples I, i'm gonna have one process which is the one definition but i'm gonna have three tasks three instances of this process for each sample the input is going to be different right for each of these instances so here you can see the name of the sample, right? The replicate ID, it appears here between parentheses. 
Good. One thing we could do, just because we are having all this dot out, let's see how it looks like. Let's just add here dot out to get the output channel and view to view that. And I'm gonna rerun this pipeline. Everything's gonna be cached because we just ran it, but it will print to the screen now the output of the latest process that we ran. And here we have the replicate ID we don't have now a list of files, they're just the second item of this channel is the split that band, and the third one is the split by, which is the index of the aligned file, right? Cool, I'm gonna remove that. And we are going to go to the next step, which is to do the base quality score recalibration using GATK. Here, as the input, we're gonna again have the genome FASTA file, the index made with some tools, the sequence dictionary made with PCAR, now we need a tuple containing replicate ID, a line band, and a line band file index from process tree, right? So it's the split, this thing that we just saw. That's what we, it needs as input. And we also need a tuple containing the future recorded VCF file in the tab index. So remember which one we, you, we did this? We can come here. Uh, where we have the tab X. Okay, it's the process 1D. So we need the prepare underline VCF underline file output as input of this one here. And, and as output, we're gonna have a tuple. Whenever you see tuple, you can think of as one thing with very thing, many things inside, right? So here we have a tuple containing the sample ID, the replicate ID, and the unique band file, and the unique band index file after this recalibration, right? So here we have the function, another mullet container, because we're going to have GATK and some tools, right? As input, we already saw what is the input. Here, replicate ID, bandy by. Here we have the prepare variance file and the prepare variance file index. As output, a tuple, which has the sample ID, the replicate ID, it's the same thing. We just use a different name so that we can refer to both IDs, but this one is from this tuple and this one from this other tuple. So we use different names. And here in the script block, we're gonna just change what is the sample ID. We're gonna get the replicate ID and replace with this regular expression here. And we're going to run the base recalibrator and the print reads for the final band file. Then we're gonna use some tools to create an index with the final unique band files from the alignments. And then now you have to fix this blank, right? And here you go. If you want to try, pause this video. I'm going to show the solution in three, two, one. Here we have the PARMS genome, which is the reference genome, the output of the SUM2 index, the output of the Picard sequence dictionary, the output of the reads split on the end cigar, and the output of when we prepare the VCF file, uh, filtering and, re and recording the set of variants. So let's copy this and replace our workflow block. If it's not clear, we are always replacing the workflow block because new things are being added. And then we add also the new process that we just created in the previous step. So four, three, and so on. Let's run this again with cache. And because we would resume, and because most things are cached, only the final process that we just wrote will be computed. So one sample, we align one sample, we split one sample, we uh, recalibrate one sample. It's very quick because we are only using one sample with two, parent, with two reads, right? Now we're gonna finally do the variant calling. So we're gonna use the haplotype caller command of GATK you can find information about the parameters here, just like at the beginning you had the manual of GATK with all these commands that you can investigate more. And again, feel more than welcome if you wanna pause the training, go read a bit, come back so that you have a better understanding, it's completely fine. This training video will be made available on YouTube afterwards, so you can check it whenever you want, it's gonna always be there, just like we have the foundational training and previous training, training sessions that we provided both Nextflow and NFCore. 
So this next one, this RNA seq underline call underline variants, we're gonna have us input the genome FASTA file, the index made with some tools, the, the sequence dictionary made with PCAR, a tuple containing the replicate ID, the aligned band file, and the aligned band file index from the previous process is already recalibrated, right? And the output is gonna be a tuple containing the sample ID and the resulting variant calling file, which is what we are after, even though we still need to do some post-processing. So here, note that in process four, we use the sample ID, not replicate ID, as the first element of the tuple in the output that we're going to use now. Now we combine the replicates by grouping them on the sample ID. So it follows from this that the process four is run one time per replicate. And process five is run one time per sample. So here we have the cause of GATK to do the haplotype color in the variant filtration. And you have to fill this blank. I'm going to ask you to pause if you want to try to solve that. And I'm going to show the solution in three, two, one. And that's what we have here. Param's genome, like before, but now we're going to get the out from some 2 card and now the out from recalibrate. We're not going to get the VCF here or the split cigar because we recalibrated these guys, right? So the output from recalibrate. Sometimes you can have multiple output channels from the same process. Everything here, even though we have multiple input channels, we always have one output channel. That's why we're using dot out and we get it. If you have multiple output channels, things can be more complicated. And then you have to specify the position of the output, the first and second, or you can use the emit keyword that is going to, is a named output. You can think of it like this. But here it's simple, we have one output channel, so we don't have to worry about that for now. Again, we're gonna use the tag uh, here with the sample ID, so we can easily see here what sample is being processed. Let's copy this like before, let's overwrite the workflow block and let's paste it and let's run it down. Hmm, there's an error here. Let's see the final man. Maybe it's the wrong container that I'm using. Oops, no container here. So let's get here the container line and now it will be able to find the program to run this analysis. And now we are calling your variants. Calling your calling variants. Good. In the next step, uh, we're going to start our post-processing. So we're going to create two processes, one for a really specific expression and the other one for RNA editing analysis. So we're going to process this VCF result, this variant calling we just did, to prepare these variants for this, at the beginning for this LA specific expression, right? We're going to do both processes together. So I think by now you already felt used to all these things we are doing, so let's try to make it more difficult. Two processes at a time. The first process, it's called post underline processes underline VCF, is going to do this processing of the VCF file on each sample. The input is the tuple containing the sample ID and VCF file, which is the output we just did here, right? Uh, let's go here. The output is simple, simply the sample ID and the final VCF file. You may ask, Marcel, you are saying that the, f the output file is named final.vcf, but if I have many samples, won't I have a conflict of one file trying to overwrite the other? So you're, you should probably be aware that in Nextflow, when you let this tree work, 
the reason we have so many different folders here is that Nextflow has an isolated folder for every task. So if the same process has 10 tasks, you're going to have 10 folders. So the same file names won't be an issue here. Of course, that if we have this, the channel having a single element, which is the file, it could be some issue, even though there's the path, which is different and then it won't be. But here we have the sample ID in the stuple. So we don't have to worry about this usually, the, the, the name of the file. And the output is going to be a tuple containing the sample ID, the VCF file, and a file containing common SNPs. Second process, so maybe we should go to the first process here and see in more detail. We have a mult container because we need VCF in a specific version. Grep was there by default, but we needed a VCF tools in a specific version that we couldn't find, so we did a mult container. It has a tag, and now we have a published year process directive. The published year process directive, it tells you that you want to store some output files of this process specifically in a very specific folder. You don't want it to be in the work directory with all this crazy names path that you saw. You want a specific one. We showed at the very beginning that params.results is a folder called results. So I want the output of this process to be in a folder called results slash and then there's something. Uh, slash sample ID, right? Where does the sample ID comes from? Here, the input. The input we saw already, it's a sample ID. And the second item of the tuple is the final.vcf file. But we are also going to get the filtered and recoded VCF files in the TBI which is the output of this 1D process here. As output, we're going to have the sample ID, the final ETF file, but we're also going to have a new file, which is the common single nucleotide polymorphisms. We have here grab to filter, do some filtering here, and then we're going to run the VCF tools command. For the second process, we're going to have a prepare underline VCF for ASE, which is a little uh, specific expression the command is going to do that, prepare the VCF for a little specific expression and generate a figure in R about that. The input is a tuple containing the sample ID, the VCF file, and the commons div. So it's obvious here that the input for the second process, the second process, is the output of the first one, the one we discussed previously. And the output is going to be a tuple containing the sample ID and known snips in the sample phrase ASE and the path for a figure of the SNPs generating R as a PDF file. So here we have the two processes. And now in the workflow block, we have this blank, which obviously is going to be more than one line because we're going to be calling two processes. So in this one, maybe even more than five minutes, maybe eight, 10 minutes. And you could also try to do the other one that maybe got stuck. And I'm going to open the solution in three, two, and one. And here you are. We're going to do the post process VCF, calling the output of this two. In the next one, the output of the previous one. So let's copy the solution, overwrite our workflow block, because it has the last two processes in the new workflow block. Let's run this with the resume so we don't lose the cache. Be very careful because if you run this without the dash resume, it's going to overwrite the task that you already ran and it's going to mask your whole analysis in the sense that you have to run everything again. Nothing bad is going to happen, it's just that you're going to waste time. First one was very quick, the second one too. Good. Now we can get, go to the final step, the process seven. So here it's a bit more complicated. So we've seen the basics of using processes in Nextflow, yet one of the features of Nextflow is the operations that can be performed on channels outside of processes. Sometimes you have this channel and you want to run a process, but the input of the process is different from the current format of your channel. So you can use channel operators to operate on this channel to transform it for you, right? Mm. You can go to docs.nextflow.io and you have a list of channel operators there. So here, as you can see, you have 
we're gonna use chain of operation. We're gonna get the output of the recalibrate step. That's why the dot out. We're gonna use do something here. So clicking the plus, we're gonna use an operator that groups tuples that contain a common first element, which is the replicate ID, right? The second one, we're gonna use an operator that joins two channels, taking a key into consideration. So you can click here for more details. It's gonna take you to an operator called join in the next whole documentation. Then we're gonna use map, which is a channel operator that applies a function to every element of a channel. Again, uh, here it explains what I just said. And the set is just channel operator to save this channel after all these transformations, save this channel with a new name, right? And here it's telling you to use the grouped underline VCF underline done by channel as the output name. This one, maybe even more than 10 minutes. I think you should really try. So if by, by now you haven't really stopped and tried, I think this exercise, it's difficult enough and important enough for you to understand the basics of this use of channel operating next flow. I would really recommend you to stop for at least 10 minutes and try to do that and run the pipeline and see if it works because this one is very important for you to solidify let's say your next flow knowledge so you can read a lot about next flow you have this training materials you have so much content on youtube you have so many pipelines to look at you have the whole next flow documentation but if you don't make your hands dirty if you don't try to write your pipelines or to modify pipelines it will be very hard for you to, to master Nextflow. So I, I really insist that you should pause the video and try uh, to, to, to write some code based on these instructions here. And of course, if you open this, this, this training material, you can click on solution and see the solution, but I would recommend you not to do that. To at least try 10 minutes to do this before you see the solution. So pause now if you want to try it because I'm gonna open the solution in three, two, one. So that's the solution here. And what I'm going to do with you is to run this each step at a time so you see what's really happening. So let's override the workflow block here. And I'm going to comment everything. The first thing I want to show you is how this this channel look like. So dash resume, of course, so we don't have to recompute everything. Everything will be already computed. I'm just gonna print to the screen. So I have one channel element, which is in the ID, the band, and the by. Cool. Then now I want to group tuple. Here, nothing is really going to, do, to, to, to change because I only have one key, right? Mm, so actually, it would be nice to use more samples. So what we can do actually is to run this again. But I'm going to do reads, oops, dash dash reads. And I'm going to do data, this guy here, oops, data reads. This guy here, I'm going to use the cock, coq, uh, star. So it's going to get both q1 and q2. Underline uh, fast QGZ. So this will run the whole pipeline again. Even though in the first sample we already have cache, we don't have for the second one. So all this guy are cached because creating the indexes and in everything at the VCF file, it doesn't take the reads into consideration, right? The, the reference genome is the same, it's only one. Uh, the known variants and blacklist, they are only one, so nothing changes. But when it goes to the, to the mapping, now it's a different thing because we have new samples, right? And it's going to, to run everything again because we, we path a different path to get, I think the cache won't work here. So it will run all this for this four reads, which are two samples. So this is going to take a while. In the meantime, I think we could have a look. Uh, let's go to NF core. And I want to show you some pipelines. So we can have a look at, for example, viral recon. 
So via recon, it, it does assembly and interhost low frequency variant calling for, vario, for viral samples. Maybe it's not what, we, what you want to do for variant calling in your work, but let's have a look here what it does. So every time you are looking for uh, an F core pipeline, you can come to this page, the pipeline, and click the one you want. You're going to have this first introduction tab with a lot of information about the pipeline. You have the subway plot where you have explaining all the steps, all the different paths. You can, you can, you can skip some steps. You can do some different types of analysis. So when you have these different uh, colors here, the actual different analysis, right? So we're going to use IVAR and consensus for the blue line. Uh, the pink one, it used BCF tools. The other one, you know, so you have these different paths in your, your subway plot. Here, what it shows is what is done. So you have the merge of resequence FastQ files. You do read, you do FastQC. You use FastP to do adaptive trimming. You use Kraken to do removal of host reads. You do the read, the variant calling using like you're gonna align the reads. You're gonna sort and index these alignments like the bay that we just did. We're gonna do primary synchronous removal. You're gonna do duplicate read make, uh, marking. We're gonna do alignment level QC, the quality and control. We're gonna do lots of things for this variant calling part with consensus and everything else. In the end, you're gonna do de novo assembly. And by the end of it, you should have uh, the files enough to present a quality and control and visualization for raw read and alignment. Using multi QC, you're gonna have a report about everything it did for you. Uh, this first one is for Illumina, and here you have for Nanopore. So for both types of data, this pipeline works. You have a quick start here, saying the minimum version you need to use this pipeline. You have to install Docker or Singularity or Conda or any container technology, right? So that you don't have to install all these softwares. You just have to pull the, 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 the pipeline, have your data, and run it. And because you have Conda or Docker or something like this installed, it will create the containers, pull the container images with all the software installed, libraries, configuration, and it will run the pipeline for you. You can provide a dash profile test to use input test data from the pipeline. So you don't have data, but you want to see how it works, how it looks in the end, you can do that. And you, you have to specify an output directory with dash dash out here. So there are some other instructions here uh, for different formats and so on, different data. It has some documentation, it's some credits, right? People who have contributed to this pipeline. Cool. If you go to usage, you're gonna have some extra information about the usage. Uh, how are the parameters, options. So extra information is required to use this pipeline. Here you have a very long and detailed description of every parameter, every option, the type of the data, a help text, what's expected, if it's mandatory or not, it's required here, as you can see. You have hidden uh, parameters, a very, very extensive and detailed list of all the parameters of this pipeline specifically. Here you have information about the output, which is very nice. And here you have even some examples of output. For Illumina, for example, you're going to have here uh, some example of, of the output of every step that we put in published here. And here you have some information about the releases, right? The latest one was this 2.6.0. And in many pipelines, mostly the most famous ones, you already have a bite-sized talk, which one of the authors usually presenting the pipeline in detail for you. So the, the pipeline, the bite-sized talk is going to be here on the right of every pipeline. We can go to the Sarek one, for example, which is another one very famous that also does some variant, it also detects variants. You have here, uh, the video, right? Let's see if it's over. It's over. Okay. So now, hmm, something not what I expected. So let's try to do this here. Um, Let's go to the workflow block. It's like a live debugging. I made a mistake. Let's try to find out what happened. I'm going to do a view here. I want to see what's inside of the channel, the reads. Mm, I wanted to get these four files, but I think, yeah, it's not working. It's only getting the first. Uh, 
Arm Reads. I'm gonna use the Return here, which is a nice thing that you want the pipeline to stop here, don't do anything else, so we don't waste much time. Mm, I have to use Double Quote, I think, so I can resolve this star here as everything that has this beginning. Let's see if that was a mistake. Yeah, that was a mistake. Okay, now you see we have the two samples I want. So you remove this return. I'm gonna run this again. Yeah, now the cache worked for everything. Actually, I could have deleted this. Uh, the cache worked for the first sample, which you read. Now it's doing the second part for everything. So the mapping of the first one, this Q1 here, it, it already occurred. Now we are working on the second one, this Q2 one, Q2 two. It's gonna take a while to do this. Let's go back to the NF core comments while this is running. So there are many different pipelines here that do variant calling. If you do variant, you're gonna see a few of them. So here you can call and score variants from whole genome sequencing. Uh, you have deep variant, some of them are under development, some of them are archived, some of them uh, are being up to date, and they have a recent release and everything else. But all of them, you go there, let's go for example, viral integration. I'm gonna have here introduction, uh, usage, parameters, and everything. So you can see it's a very early version, but there's a lot of diversity here in what you can find. You can see here in squares, you can sort by different things. So as I said at the very beginning, if you really want to have a look at a variant calling pipeline, a real one, this is the place to go. So let's go at RNA var, for example. Here you can click at the GitHub repository, right? So one thing I do a lot, and because we are in an intermediate level, next for training, let's say I'm going to give you this tip here. When you, uh, in a lot of times I want to try to do something and I'm not sure how it's done because the NF Core project has so many pipelines, so many modules, so many projects with the best practices, you can just go to the organization NF Core and you can type here. For example, let's say I want to do publish tier, type this and I'm going to find lots of different, uh, okay, not a lot. And it's not too, I'm gonna find here a thousand occurrences in codes, you know, in, in RNA fusion, SARAC, RNA seq, all these different RNA, uh, NF core pipelines, and they're using publish tier in many different ways. So, like something, one thing is slightly more complex that people use group key. It's not very easy to understand what it does. You can just type group key here, and you see all these examples of NF core pipelines using that. Uh, I don't know, someone use flat map. It's a channel operator. It's not clear to me what it does. You can come here and see how it's done, uh, like this example here, on NF Core. Let's see how it's working here. Uh, don't tell me the browser killed my tab. I'm going to refresh this one. And you know, it's on my machine, it's in, it's in the cloud, so it should still be running the way I left it. Where is my terminal? Give it back to me. Yep, it concluded. So as you see, starting from the mapping part, we have now two of two. And then we have two of two for split cigar, recalibrate, variance, and everything else. So now let's do what I was trying to, to show you. I'm going to everything is commented. I want to group tuple, right? Uh, here the view is showing what's in the recalibrate output channel. Not what I want anymore, I want to group tuple and I want to view, okay, no, let's do it this way. See what's inside. So the group, the recalibrate, we have two of two. Let's see the output channel. Okay, the first channel we have this as the key. Here we have the bun, here with the buy, here for the first one, here for the second one. 
So as you can see, they have the same replicate ID because they are the same replicate, right? Q1 and Q2. So I'm going to use group tuple. I'm going to uncomment this, remove this view here, and add view afterwards. I want to see this new channel after the group tuple. And I can, you probably already know what's going to happen. It's going to be now one channel element because they group them based on this key. So we have this key and we have now a list of all these files. So bun and buy and bun and buy. First item, which is the replicate ID. Second item, which is a list of the bands of the first one. And third item, which is a list of the bun and buy of the other one. Now, I want to join this with the output of this prepare VCF for ASE. But, as you saw in the process here, this time we have multiple outputs. And we use the emit that I told you to give a name to that. So we have two outputs. And what I'm saying is that I want the output of this process, dot out, dot, VCF on the line for ASE. That's what I'm, I'm saying here. So I'm going to get this output channel and I want to join with the previous one. And because they have the same key, the same first element, this is going to be one channel element with everything. So let's put the dot view here. Oops. Let's run this again and see what the output will be like. Good. We have one channel element with the replicate ID, the first item, the second item, and the third item, now we have the known snips. Good. This fourth line here uses map, which I already told you, it applies a function to every element, channel element, every element in the channel. And what here is saying is like, you know, I'm telling you before like the dash bigger than, you're saying what it is how you how you want to to represent what's inside the channel and it's saying there's a meta which is the id the replicate there's a list with bonds a list with buys and a list with the vcf and i want to change the order i want the vcf to be the second one the bond to be the third one and the buys to be the fourth one so the only thing we are doing here is to reorganize the order of the items inside our channel elements and then we save that in a grouped underline VCF, underline bun, underline by, underline CH channel. So in the end, we can see that with the view. And you see that basically what's going to cha change is the order. The VCF here is, in, is the last one. Now it's going to be the second, the second one. Good. Let's go back to our Let's close this file explorer. Let's go back to our hands on training, pipeline implementation. Uh, we were here. Yeah, and the solution we saw already is this one. Nice. Let's remove this view here. Just run one more time to make sure I removed all the views so that we have a cleaner screen. Everything's cached, good. And now we go to the final process, which is going to do the allele specific expression analysis with the GATK command ASE -E -E read counter. So it's going to calculate allele counts at a set of positions with GATK tools. The input is the genome FASTA file, the reference file we've used so many times, the index file from some tools, the sequence dictionary from, from Picard, in this channel that we just created. So as I told before, sometimes we you have a channel and you have a process that wants to receive something like that, but not exactly that. Then you're going to use channel operators to transform the channel in a way that it can be an input to the next process that you want. And you could say, yeah, but why don't I change the process to accept the channel the way it is? The thing is, sometimes you need to really transform that because the programs you want to use expect files in a certain format. So you have to do this organization. Here, the output's gonna be a TSV file called ASE.TSV. This is what we have. So now it's a different thing. We, I always gave you the process ready and you wanted to write the call. Now I'm giving to you 
what the pipeline, what the step does, and I want you to create the process. So of course, you can go to your main.nf and look at the previous processes, the structure, how they were done to write your own, your own here. I would probably say 10, 15 minutes to solve this one. Make sure you don't rush, you do it with calm. You see here what's the name of the process you have to choose, what it does, which is given here. What's the input, what's the output. So I really recommend you again to pause the video and try to solve this one. And I'm going to show you the solution in three, two, one. The name of the process was provided. You use the GATK container that we already used in the past. You use tag, which is optional, but interesting, like published here to organize your, your files. The input, you gave a name, genome index dict. As I said, it's positional, so it doesn't matter. The fourth one, you have a saver ID, a VCF, a band in a bay. The output, as it was said here at the top, it has to be ASC.TSV. That's what you did. And the script block, just copy paste what I gave before above. For the workflow block, you have to also write the function call, which is pretty simple compared to writing the process, which is more complicated. By doing that, uh, we can save this, override our workflow block. We can run it again. And we're gonna finally finish the pipeline because now it's done everything we need for this variant calling pipeline. Congratulations. Let's see if you can do here the yeah balloons and some confetti maybe. Ah uh, no. Anyway, <laughs> congratulations for getting to the end. It's one of one. We have a single output file also. One thing we can do here is to go to this results folder that we chose and everything is going to be here. We have this, let me download this PDF file. Here we have the ASCTSV. You have the contig, the position, the variant, it was a T. Uh, the reference was an A and so on. So here you, you have 30, as we saw only for the chromosome 22, right? Mm, not sure if you will be able to see the PDF, just the way I'm recording my screen, but if you can see the PDF, it's just a plot showing this analysis for the allele expression. So I'm closing the PDF now. So you have the outputs here, the final VCF. Here, for example, sometimes FST was a C and so on, the non SNPs and all these things. So here in the results overview, just if you're curious, I won't get into much detail here, but if you're curious about how to interpret the output, you can read this more calmly. So you have the final VCF file, which contains all the somatic variations called from this RNA-seq data. Uh, you see variants that pass all filters, so with the pass keyword in the seventh field or the PCF file, and also those that did not pass one or more filters. You have the common SNPs file, you have the explanation here for all this, uh, the columns, the ASE TSV, you have also the description here about the, the columns because they are TSV, for, right? They are tab separate values. You have uh, this PDF that contains the histogram plot for the allele frequency for SNPs common to RNA-seq and non-variant from DNA. As bonus tab, you can run everything, right? And if if somehow you think you messed something when you copy pasted, you broke something and you are lost, uh, you don't know what to do to make it work, the main.nf that we built step by step, but you still want to see the full pipeline working, there's a file called final underline main here on, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the folder, and it has the complete version of this pipeline. So you can just use this if you want to see the pipeline working. So here now I run this command, the bonus tab, with everything that we have, which are six samples, right? We have the replicates here, but there are six, and that's why we have here now six mappings. Two were cached, this is doing four. It's going to take a while, because this mapping indeed takes a while, we saw it already, 
but in the end it's gonna add some steps to every process afterwards and some processes that we have to be recomputed no cache like this ASE non snips with that we end this hands-on training there's nothing else after that uh, I would like to really remind you about the next courses that we're going to have we had the foundational training if you didn't do it I really recommend you to do it the hands-on training today and soon we're going to have the advanced next level training in a way you could think of these trainings as introduction intermediate and advanced I would also like to remind you about the summit the next level summit that we're going to have in Barcelona in October and in Boston in November this is the annual event of, of next loads where all the community gathers the talks are amazing you can also join virtually of course for the Barcelona one uh, the talks are amazing there's the hackathon before the whole community meet and discuss and announcements are amazing every year new technologies new features new amazing next flow pipelines so I really recommend you to attend at least virtually so a lot of learning definitely with that I would like to thank you for your attention remind you that you can still ask questions even before this training on the earlier mentioned Slack channel and that's it I hope you enjoyed it and have fun in the exercises in your next flow path bye bye